All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Live conversation for, what is it, uh, Thursday, June 17th, 2021. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we always appreciate you coming here. Obviously, when you get here, say hi. Let us know that you're here and let us know where you're joining the conversation from. Uh, it is our live Sessions, so we have people coming in from Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube and Twitch. Probably going to be a huge crowd coming in from the Twitch side, would be my guess today. Um, but we come here uh, for this live session every Thursday afternoon for one reason so that we can find clarity around the things that matter most to you, the architect. And it doesn't matter if you're the employee of a firm or you have your own firm. Maybe you circled a date on the calendar and you said 2021 is my year and you're off on off to the races and on the runway to starting your own thing, or maybe you've had a firm for a year or 10 years or what is it, 26 years, and you're starting to rethink or reimagine what that firm could or maybe should be. All of the topics that we cover, one topic every day, they're all the need to know topics for the success of small firm architects just like you. So thanks for joining us here. Uh, like I said, we've got people coming in from all over the internet we're actually trying to break it. That's that's our goal, is try to break the internet by covering all the bases. Uh, a reminder, if you're on Facebook, you're coming to us from a private Facebook group, which means Facebook's rules regarding privacy um, matter. Uh, they, they rule here. So um, you will show up on the screen. As you see the uh, comments scrolling on the right side of the screen, you'll show up as Facebook user unless you give Facebook permission to share your information to Restream, which is the platform that we use here. If you do that, you can show up like Liz does. She's, her uh, Liz shows up. Hi from Charlottesville, Liz. Liz shows up as Elizabeth Hunter Sloan because she's gone to the URL that's right there in the bottom left of your screen, chat.restream.io slash FB, as in Facebook. So if you would like uh, for your name to appear with your comment, Go ahead and click on that URL. You can set that up in just a matter of seconds, and then we won't call you Facebook user anymore. We'll call you by the name that your mom gave you. So <laughs> with that, or wherever um, you got if, it. <clears throat> or, or wherever you got it. I don't know. You may have yeah. may have got it from a Cracker Jack box and changed it to whatever you wanted it to be. I'm not really sure. We'll mm. call you whatever you want us to call you. Um, if you're joining us in the future on the recorded, <laughs> the podcast version, hello. Uh, welcome. Glad you're listening in on this conversation today. Like I said, we're recording this right now on June 17th, 2021. And we've been talking all week about creating momentum for your ideas, for your business, for your life. The reason that we've been using that theme for the week is, as we do every week, we have arranged everything around our special guest. Like I said, special guest every Thursday. We use what we're going to talk about with that special guest to create the theme for the week. And then we have a topic every day for the Context and Clarity Lives uh, or conversations at 4 p.m. Eastern. So today, we're finally joined by that special guest. I'm excited about this one, Catherine. So am I. We, uh, Catherine and I, spend a lot of time preparing for these conversations, usually reading a book or listening to a book, listening to a lot of interviews, reading some blog posts. And um, this this guest has has a uh, quite a body of work. Uh, I'm really I've followed this person for years now. Um, this is exciting for me. I've they're they're an author. I'm going to spill the beans on that right now. Uh, I've read or listened to a number of their books. Not all nine of them. We'll get into that. But I don't think I've covered all nine. Maybe about six of them. But um, this is a person that I've looked up to for a long time, and I'm I'm. I hope that you all get as much out of this conversation. Uh, I think you will, uh, as as I'm thinking that that we will, because in his latest book, there's a lot of a lot of uh, applications for a lot of different things that you do, and and this this may be a wide ranging conversation today, and it's probably going to tie back to some of our past guests as well. So we'll see where this goes. Um, with that. He's probably eaten all of the M&Ms that we left in the green room for him, so we ought, probably ought to bring him out at this point. <laughs> Our guest today is a bacon aficionado. 
He doesn't know Oprah, and he's okay with that. He's a tremendous keynote speaker, an educator, and someone that's always been out on the edge of digital marketing while tirelessly working to cinch the divide between technology and humanity. His blog is Grow, his podcast is The Marketing Companion, and he's the best-selling author of groundbreaking books like Return on Influence, The Content Code, and his most recent, Cumulative Advantage. Mark Schaefer, welcome to Context and Clarity Live. I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really nice introduction. Uh, you know, there's so much there. You know, it's like how much do you put into the th- into the introduction, and there's just some things that you can't leave out. So, <laughs> so there you go. Well, thank, thank you. you, thank you, and thank you for reading my books and for your support. I really appreciate it. I'm excited. Oh, I'm excited to be here. As I mentioned to you, I'm sort of an architectural geek. I love buildings. I I wanted as a kid, I wanted to be an architect, but my career went a different way. So, this is this is like. This is like my fantasy interview today. <laughs> well, we'll <laughs> we'll try not to disappoint, but uh, maybe uh, I need but, to get a better fantasy. I don't know, but this is my <laughs> this is where I am right now in my life. No, that's it's it's good to dream. And so Mark told us before we went live that he's headed up in uh, in a little bit of of time here to see uh, Falling Water, yeah. um, which is actually not far from your neck of the woods, right? From where you grew up, not that far. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I live in Tennessee now, but I, I grew up in, in Pittsburgh, but never had a chance to go over there before. So one of my best friends who, who studied architecture, this is this is like this has been his dream. So I said, let's go. So we're gonna take a trip and go to see Falling Water. Nice. Nice. That'll be a that'll be a great trip. Congratulations on on that. Um like I said, I, I was trying to remember, I think. I don't remember if I read these things in order, but I know I read the Dow of Twitter. I don't know if that was the first one. Yeah, but it was. Um, it, yeah, it was. It was the your first, but I don't know if I read it in that order. So yeah, right. Um, but I, I was thinking back to that and thinking about you know we were talking earlier about uh, marketing rebellion, of course, cumulative advantage, and it really strikes me that um, I, I, I know I'm I'm headed dangerously close to left field at this point. So, so being, oh, being a, being so a Pittsburgh soon, guy, so soon in the show. Yeah, yeah, so soon, just, just a few minutes in. Um, so being a Pittsburgh guy, uh, maybe you just channel Willie Stargell and rein me back in, but um, I, I'm a huge fan of comedy of stand up, and Jerry Seinfeld is one of my favorite comics. And it seems to me that you and Jerry Seinfeld have a very similar superpower, which is the power of observation. He's a great observational comic. And I think that um, as I, I have read a lot of your work, I think there's there's so much in-depth observation of, of course, research too. You put a ton of research into all of your books, but I, I think the, the ability to uh, see and observe and, and realize what's going on and what's coming is, is an amazing ability of yours. Yeah, thank you. You know, <clears throat> no one ever has, have, has ever really put it that way before, but I can I can see that. You know, the way I sort of view my own, uh, the way I connect to the world is I have a way of, of looking at trends and, and seeing, like, what comes next. And I have a pretty good track record of being able to see where are we and what's happening and what's the natural conclusion of where we're going to go next. So, but that does, that does take keen observation and just being aware and, and reading and observing. So I, I, I like that. That's, that's a nice compliment. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're, you're welcome. And it, uh, you know, when we think about your book, your latest book, cumulative advantage and, you know, creating momentum. And like I said, in the intro, We've so we do context and clarity five days a week, every weekday afternoon, but we only go live like this with a guest to, to the simulcast version, is what we call it on Thursdays. But what we do is we we try to make the topics for every day sort of match up with the theme that we'll talk about with Mark Schaefer, right? Yeah, cool. So 
So we started Monday talking about where ideas come from, and then we talked about um, connecting with people and influencers, et cetera. Um, we'll talk about goals tomorrow. And I think, you know, at some point we'll, we'll probably jump ahead into applying the five steps that you talk about in the book to the small firm scenario, small business, uh, small business people. But one of the things that had, that really captivated me and entertained me through the cumulative advantage was this thread. And I know everybody, everybody asks you about this. I'm going to do the same, but this thread of you versus Tim Ferriss <laughs> and the reason that that I think is so applicable to a lot of our audience, again, many small firm audience or small firm architects in the audience is that there are an awful lot of sole proprietors, an awful lot of people that are wearing the 17 hats of an entrepreneur that are fighting an uphill battle and they might be looking out going, how in the world did this person, did this architect get that project or, or why, why do I seem to be not able to compete with this other person across the street or across town or something like that? What's, what is it? What is, how are they winning all of these projects? And so I wondered in my head is, is Tim Ferriss in some way, is he the small firm architect character in cumulative advantage? Yeah, I, I, I think so. So to, sort of explain what, what what's going on with this comparison. You know, first of all, let's back way up and, and talk about why what's going on. Why did I write this book? And I think this is something a lot of people can relate to. I'm a small business, but I think really a business of any size right now has to be preoccupied with one thing. How do we stand out? How can we be heard? How can we be found? in this very noisy, overwhelming world. And I can, I'm, I'm obsessed with this, really. It's, it's really kind of been the trajectory of my career. It's like, how do we stand out in this current environment? And the sad thing is, the difficult thing, is that for many people today, even if they're doing great work, they're still being buried. So I came up with this idea. It led me to this idea of momentum. If you're stuck, if you're like plateauing in your business, in your life, in your career, how do we get to that next? Level? You know, what, what is momentum? Uh, you know, is, it, is, is there a pattern? Is there a system? Can you learn about momentum? And I went down this rabbit hole and I found out that indeed, there is research that started in the 1960s and that there's sort of this pattern and that it really has been left in academia. It hasn't been applied to our lives. So I, I, I became very interested in this idea. So then I started looking for case studies of people that seemingly had nothing. Maybe they grew up in, in abject poverty Maybe they had some difficult difficulty in their life that they had to overcome, and they created this momentum. Did they fit this pattern? Could I see this pattern? Was it real? The stuff that's in the research. So I, I started researching Tim Ferriss because I thought, this guy is a money machine. If you're not familiar with Tim, he wrote a New York Times bestselling book called The 4-Hour Workweek. And then he's, he's just become a superstar. He's a franchise. Uh, everything he touches turns to gold. He's become a VC investor. He has a, you know, one of the top podcasts. He's a best-selling author. Uh, he's a high, one of the highest paid speakers in the world now. So I thought, okay, well, there must have been a lot of things in his past that, that prepared him for this. He must have come from a wealthy family and, you know, had all this special training and education. And I read and I read and I dug and I dug and there was nothing. In fact, Tim has been very transparent about his journey. And he was he was a sickly child. He was 
bullied. He had physical problems. He had psychological problems. He su suffered through depression. Uh, he grew up in a very modest household, you know, no private schools or anything. Uh, I think he got his college degree in like some sort of obscure Japanese, I don't know, philosophy or something. Now, from that point to understand 10 years later, he's hanging out with LeBron James and Hugh Jackman and Oprah. It just, it, it seems impossible. It's just something amazing must have happened. So I kept on going. What did he do? And it wasn't that hard to figure out because he talks about everything. And it, it fit the pattern, right? All this pattern, all this, 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 the, the, the ideas in this research just sort of fit. It lined up. I couldn't have written a better script. And it lined up for me. It lines up for everyone, every person, every business. The pattern is the same. And that's really the power of the book. The first way to really create momentum is to understand that it almost always happens the same way. And in some, some very surprising ways. And, and, you know, for Tim, before he wrote his best-selling book, he, 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 he was burned out on his business. He was near a mental breakdown. He was considering suicide. He lost his girlfriend. He just gave up everything and went to Europe. Now, that is Tim Ferriss, more or less, one year before he's hanging out with LeBron James. So I liked, I liked this because it was so improbable. It's like how in the world, if he could do it, maybe anybody could do it. And there's a lot of inspiring case studies in the book um, that, that the people seem to love. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, so I appreciate the, the setup for that. And, and uh, for, for everybody else that's out there, you need to, if, if you want to understand more about this thread of, of Mark Schaefer versus, versus Tim Ferriss, you know, a little tongue in cheek there, but uh, you, you have to pick up the book, Cumulative Advantage. Um, one thing I wonder, again, you know, I, I think, I don't know that any, anybody in the audience right now is saying, hey, I want to be the Tim Ferriss of architecture. I don't know if anybody's saying that. But um, I'm pretty sure there are plenty in the audience that are saying, wouldn't it be great if I could level up, if I could move up, if I could be, become better known in Knoxville, Tennessee, or Chicago, Illinois, or wherever it is that they are? What's, what is it that they... What is it that they need to be doing to to start and create that momentum? Well, so uh, one of the amazing things that I discovered in my research, uh, and I would also really recommend a book written by a guy named Franz Johansson. He wrote a book called The Click Moment. It sounds like a boring book about SEO, but it's not. It's about... Um, really what what is the beginning of success and his theory was and his research showed that almost every successful person and every successful business starts with a random event it's not a plan it's not a vision it's not a strategy it's just you're in the right place at the right time or you were inspired by a book or you were inspired by a speaker or you you know you 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 were you know, you were in a new place and you said, oh my gosh, I've never seen that before. I want to bring it to my hometown. That's how Starbucks started. Starbucks was a little coffee shop in, in, in Seattle. They roasted coffee and the owner went to Europe and saw like a, a bodega, you know, a little cafe on every corner. He said, we don't have that in America. He, he just connected the dots in a new way. It was a random experience. So how do we start momentum? It's really being aware of, of the changes in the world. Strategy and, and success 30 years ago or 40 years ago, 
you know, you, you had to make something and you had to test it and you had to prototype it. Today, it's really about being aware of what are your strengths, what are your competencies, and then what is happening in the world that's changing with trends, with taste, well, with something like the pandemic. The pandemic is changing everything. So what, I'm, what I talk about in the book is looking for fractures in the status quo. Every time there's a fracture in the status quo, it's a shift. It's an opportunity. So, for example, if you're reading about, oh, my gosh, we're in the pandemic and people are working at home and they're trying to educate their children at the same time. And let's say you are someone who is homebound, but you're a tutor and you like math. You could say, wait a minute, there's an opportunity here. Something's changed. The world needs me. Boom, I'm going to pursue that idea. And that's really the, the genesis of momentum. It's, it's not just an idea. It's the pursuit of an idea and matching it with some shift in the world. I call that the scene. And uh, let me just give you a quick example that was in the news last week. This is a non-architectural example, but it was just something that I saw in the news. I saw this news and I saw this news headline, Hallmark greeting cards, the biggest greeting card company in the world. The headline says they are exiting the e-card business. Now the whole world has gone to e-commerce. This does not make sense. What's the shift? So I read the article. Here are Hallmark's two big customer bases. Number one, senior citizens. They do not like sending cards over the computer. So boom, that didn't work. Here's their second biggest audience, Gen Z. And guess what? Gen Z doesn't want computer cards either. They want handmade artisanal paper cards. Now, if I'm an artist that likes making cards, I'm going to start a TikTok channel. I'm going to show Gen Z how I'm making all my cards. Boom. Could be a new business. So it's paying attention to what are the shifts that are happening now. And there's so many. The pandemic is the greatest fracture in the status quo in the history of the world. It's reinventing how we work, where we work, how we commute or don't compute, how we learn, how we eat, how we connect, how we entertain ourselves, how we work out. Everything is changing. Everything is shifting. It's creating an entirely new set, new set of unmet and underserved customer needs. And all of that is an opportunity to create momentum. I, I think that's the perfect point. And one of the things that we've talked about a lot in context and clarity is you know, you know, the architectural example, it's, it's no different than what you were just talking about. If an architect has a client, whether they're a homeowner or a school superintendent or whatever they are, so it, this is the United States, the U.S. timeline. So apologies to those of you around the world that your timeline may be a little bit different than this. But from the middle of March 2020, until now, like you said, everything has changed. And so the question has to become, as an architect, to your, your client or past clients or prospective clients, what's changed and what problems do you have now that didn't exist in January of 2020? Right. Is, that's, that's, that's the seam, right? That's what we're that's looking the, for? I mean, and, and, I mean, one of the things from an, from an architectural standpoint that, that, I, that I, I, I want to challenge people about is, you know, I think there's probably a tendency to think about, well, you know, I'm an architect and we have this business and we run it this way and this is the way we've always run it. We're kind of going to stick in this lane and, you know, kind of that's what we're comfortable with. And that may work just fine. But I really think strategy today it doesn't need to be a cataclysmic shift in direction. It doesn't necessarily need to be an acquisition 
or you know moving in a new direction. What what strategy today is really is paying attention to these shifts. Uh, you know, here's another quick example. In my corporate days, I used to sell packaging, and I had the idea of putting wine in aluminum cans, or if you're from Europe, aluminium cans. And and nobody would listen to me, even though the statistics and the te- science would say this is a better protective package than a glass bottle. Now, today, 10% of all wine sales are in aluminum cans. This is 15 years after I tried to do it. Why? It, it, nothing changed in the package. Nothing changed in the wine. Millennials and younger people... They don't want heavy wine bottles. They want to throw something in their backpack, put it on some ice. You know, it's a very uh, environmental friendly package. So it was just, that's the seam, right? There's a change in taste. And so you've, when, when that seam opens and you become aware of it, you just got to charge through with all your power and your might and own it. Uh, you, you talk about that in the book, and I think it's it um, that, that that's something that we I suppose we all suffer from, probably all industries. But there is an awful lot of this is the way we've always done it, mm-hmm. and and that is um, that's certainly holding a lot of people back, a lot of firms, a lot of businesses back. One of the things that you talk about, um, and I don't I don't remember if this is the word you use, but but basically persistence. Yeah, you know the you you've got to you've got to keep moving forward. You've got to hit that seam, like you said. And you've got to keep running forward. And I think there's a lot of us that are that might be pretty good at hitting the seam. Might be okay in the short term with the persistence piece of it, but then, you know, six months, a year, something, something in. You know, and you, you talk about this a little bit with with Tim Ferriss with that that focus, right on on the the four hour everything. How do you sustain that persistence? How do how do mere mortals sustain that persistence? Well, that, that it's a really important question, and one of the things I did when I was writing the book and researching the book. I mean, I. I I, I, I worked so hard and, and you know, looked at so much research and you know, went down so many rabbit holes. But I also did some original research to sort of validate my findings. And what I did was I went out to uh, entrepreneurs who kind of started with nothing and turned it into something. They had no clear, obvious initial advantages uh, but you know something happened that this cre- that created this momentum. What I found was the five, you know, aspects of my book, the five steps in my book, they were almost completely evenly matched. It's like you know, so it's, it kind of validated I was you know on the right track. But there was a there was a sixth thing that a lot of people talked about. And it's not really a step. It's not really something to do. It's resilience. It's like a personality trait. Uh, you know, Angela Duckworth has that great book, Grit, where she did a lot of research in this area. And it's this ability to come back. If you have a new idea, or if you're trying to start a new business, or if you want to write a book, or you want to start a speaking career, or you want to, you know, be invited to a, a new board position or something, if there's something that you're going to pursue, there's going to be setbacks. Things are always going to go wrong. And part of success, yes, it's timing. It's the worthiness of the idea. It could be people helping you along the way. These are all things I write about in the book. But there is a personality aspect to it as well. And I think right in addition to resilience, it's also not panicking when things go wrong. Jim Collins, the famous author, writes, he calls this the doom loop. When something like the pandemic hits, do we just like start abandoning everything that made us great and start grasping at straws? Or do we say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We can't lose sight 
of why our customers love us, why they keep coming back to us. You know, let's, we, we, we got to figure this out. And I'm not saying don't adjust, don't pivot, do what you need to do. But the idea is resilience, tenacity, don't panic is a personality trait in hard times. I right. like this idea. I want to address this question from John about yeah. serendipity because it is, let's see, it could be the right idea and everything else is aligned, but the market isn't just ready. Right. So, I, I mean, there, there's a, there's an energizing part of your question and a depressing part of your question. <laughs> and the energizing part of your question, John, is almost, every, you know, all these successful people that we look up to, and I, I, I get into this quite deeply in the book. It was serendipity. Really. Almost every time. It was, it was, you know, it was serendipity. They had, maybe it was a stroke of luck. Maybe it was, they were born into a rich family or whatever. So we're, we're all riding the crest of a wave that started a long time ago. And some of us are on huge Bill Gates waves. And some of us are on blue collar waves. You know, we had to fight a little harder. And some people in our society are being pulled under, but they don't have a wave at all. But the, but the opportunity is being aware of the serendipity and making it work for you. Now, the, 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 the difficult part of the question was, what if your timing is off? This is the part of the book I struggled with the most. Because timing is so important and it's out of our control. And I hate that. You know, I hate that I couldn't have a chapter to say how to make timing in your control. And I read and I read and I read and I read and I you know, looked at all the best case studies and all the books about entrepreneurship. And the best thing is really to evaluate what you're doing in terms of worthiness the worthiness of the market, of the, of, of the customer? Uh, you know, does it fit in your life to be ready for the timing? And maybe the timing isn't right, you know, right now. Maybe it's going to be a few years away. But here's the thing I think should give all of us hope. 30 years ago, if we wanted to test something, you'd probably have to make something in your garage. And it was very difficult and complicated. Today, you can test almost everything very quickly on the internet. Sometimes if I have an idea, I'll just post something on LinkedIn. And I'll say, what do you think about this? And, pe and people may say, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. Where do I sign up? Some people might say, oh, you big dummy. That was done 10 years ago. So, and there's also, there's groups. There's crowdsourcing groups, crowdfunding groups. There's a place called Product Hunt where you can test new ideas, get feedback, do surveys, help pe have people collaborate to help you create you know, new business ideas. So timing is still essential, but the risk of testing something new is so small compared to what it was 20 or 30 years ago. That is something that I think should make everybody really energized and hopeful. Yeah, and I like that idea too of being ready. Um, you know, may, maybe the, the example you used of the wine, right? That's that's a that's a great one. Timing wasn't right. Yeah, you, you, yeah. you were Mark, Mark LePage has a comment here saying success is about position positioning yourself to succeed. That's exactly right. It's it's the pursuit. It's not letting your idea sit. If your idea sit, there's millions of good ideas. It's the quest. It's the pursuit. If you don't pursue, you won't know if the if the timing is right, if the seam is right. And so you, you so Mark's right. You know, if you if and there's a lot of questions in this book to help you walk through this to get yourself ready to be in the very best position. So if the timing is right, you're going to blow through it and and own it. And then once you once you have blown through it, you know you another one of the the steps in the framework is is reaching out and reaching up. Yeah. Um, can Can you explain that a little bit? I think that's something that's probably uh, for there's an awful lot of introverts 
in this crowd. Yeah. I'll tell you that right now and in the world. But um, yeah. so this may be terrifying to some, but what, what about reaching out and reaching up? Well, you know, I would be in that introvert crowd. And it's and honestly, as I reflect that on my life, this is something that I have not done well. So if you think again about this model of momentum, and if we're at this place where we're kind of stuck, one of the best things, one of the most effective things we can do is to reach up for help from somebody that can lift us up into this new traje- trajectory, this new level. And But it requires reimagining the idea of mentorship. You know, the, there's this classical view of mentorship. A mentor is a teacher. You have a long-term relationship with them. I think that's an anachronistic way to look at mentoring today. If you need to learn something, go to YouTube. You don't, you don't need a mentor. You don't have to have a, a weekly meeting or a monthly meeting with somebody. Here's the role, the true role of mentoring and momentum. Mentors open doors. They make introductions. They create new opportunities that are out of your sphere. They're, you know, they're, they're out of your access. That's one of the best ways, one of the fastest ways to get lifted up into this new level of momentum. So one of the things we have to think about is the strategy. How do we do that? Who's the right person? Traditionally, we think about, oh, it's somebody above us. Maybe it's a boss. Not necessarily. It could be somebody younger than us. It could be somebody in a completely different field, right? We have to look at our goals. How do we approach them? How do we connect to them? How does this work? So I get into that in quite a bit of depth in the book. But, you know, one of the fascinating statistics in the book, uh, I, I referenced this research that started in the 1960s. And the research started with Nobel Prize winners. How did a Nobel Prize winner become a Nobel Prize winner? And it led to this discovering some of these patterns of momentum. Here's the thing that was amazing. Of the Nobel Prize winners they studied, I think the number was 86%. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, because you read the book. I think it's 86% of the people who won a Nobel Prize had worked for somebody who won a Nobel Prize. Now, I don't think that's a coincidence. (laughs) I think the, the, the people at the top taught these younger people how to achieve, how to work in this system. Here's something that's amazing. The guy that did the research on momentum, his son won a Nobel Prize, <laughs> which I think is amazing and, and, and elegantly beautiful. So th- this idea of reaching out and reaching up is, is amazing and important and I, I kind of you know connect things at the end of the book to also talk about it's just as important to reach down and create those sparks of initiative, those sparks of momentum in others, because we all have that power. We know that's how momentum starts. It doesn't have to be money. It doesn't have to be a college education. It could be encouragement. It could be direction. It could be an idea. It could be an introduction. We all can do that. Think how powerful we are. We can create momentum in other people's lives. I think that's profound. I think that's important. That's another hope I have of this book is that we'll start to see our role in our world, in our society in a little bit of a different way. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you. And I, I think that idea that that idea of the the new version of a mentor, or what, however we describe that, as the person or people that can provide opportunities, that can open yeah. those doors. I think that is, uh, I, I agree. I think that is maybe the most important thing in the entire book. And one of the things that I, I challenge everybody that's in the audience with right now is look both directions, right? If, if you know, you're, you're in some spot, 
you, you may be 51 years old and, and a sole proprietor and running, running your own, own firm and, and you may need a door open for you to, to yeah. take the next step. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, a, it's, it's sort of a new way of thinking about momentum and it, it might be obvious to a lot of people, but I'll tell you something, Jeff, as I always learn so much when I write a book. When I write a book, it's like getting a new master's degree in a way. And it made me do a lot of introspection about where I am in my life. And you know what? I need to reach up and reach out. I do. And, and so I'm, 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 I'm learning how to take my own medicine. <laughs> well, that, I also want to, give a, I want to give a clap to Elizabeth here, who's talking about her success encouraging young people in the office. I just want to, I just want to thank you, Elizabeth. I want to clap for you. Thank you. Yeah, that's, she shares a good example there. She says she's mentoring a young woman. She just yeah. found a fantastic job. I helped her, uh, it scrolled. I helped convince her to uh, to apply for it, I think. Well, Elizabeth, Elizabeth talked about how she encouraged her. And that, yeah. that can send a ripple through history. That can send, you know, we, we can't solve the world's problems, but, but every single person today can send a ripple through history and you may not even know how it affects the world by encouraging others, by mentoring others. Yeah. I think that's an important point. I mean, we, you know, when we, so I, earlier I mentioned the Tim Ferriss thread that goes through and, and the idea that some may or may not aspire to be the Tim Ferriss of architecture. We don't have to be talking about or thinking about that scale, right? It could, it can be, little things. It can be encouraging people. It yeah. can be opening small doors for people. It's almost always something like that. I was, there's this, uh, you know, social audio platform that's kind of interesting right now called clubhouse, right? So you go on, it's like talk radio. And I was on one of these oh, talk yeah, radio. I was on one of these talk radio shows and, uh, this young man came onto the stage and he said, Mark, I saw you were in this room. I just wanted to say thank you. You were a guest lecturer at the University of Wisconsin. I was in the class and I was an adult student. I had, I, you know, I wasn't a college type. I dropped out of college. I came back as an adult. You didn't know this, but I was ready to drop out again. I just didn't know if I could make it. You stayed after class and listened to all my questions. And when I was done, asking all these questions, you said, I think you are going to be amazing. Just based on the depth of the questions you're asking, you are a natural marketer. He said, because of you, I stayed in school. That's beautiful. And, to, and today I, I have a great job and I'm supporting my family. And I just wanted to tell you that. And I, you know, I, I actually remember the guy because we've sort of stayed friends on LinkedIn and so forth. But you you, you know, you, you never, and if you think about, if you do that just as a part of your life, how those ripples can spread and spread and spread. Yeah, I, I think that's, we, we, there, we cannot discount that. Yeah. And I think it can be, you know, whether we're, whether we're talking about a, a young architect. Yeah. Or, not. I mean, it, it yeah. could be a completely different context. And, uh, it, so, and, and I, you know, I keep thinking about what you said, you know, you, you need to reach up sometimes. Yeah. I think that's important, right? It again, both ways, right? I need to reach up. I need to reach down if that's the yeah. right way to say it. I need to I give, think that's a great way to say it, Jeff. Yeah. That it, uh, for all of you that are out there, um, you know, think about that. This is, we're, we've been on the verge of a lot of change. There's been a lot going on. Um, you know, when, when we think about the workplace, when we think about the future of the workplace, uh, e even our clients, how can we, uh, some people probably are tired of hearing me say, as an architect, you have one job, and that's to make the life of your client better. And I, I think this is this is a perfect application. You know, what can you do as an architect to open a, open a door to reduce the friction for somebody to make their life or their business or whatever their context is to make it better? I'm, the, I'm just um, kind of struck. And, 
Can I just um, I, I, can I talk a little bit about the beginning of the book where you're talking about the uh, you know the twins who couldn't fail basically the because they have so twins. many advantages. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, that strikes me as I um, mean, you know, I'm one of the people. I am one of those people who went to a private school and has a safety net and has all these advantages, and yet, anyway. But we won't get into that. But that seems really unfair that some people have all these advantages and other people don't. And then I was glad that at the end of the book that you address how you can help people who, um, you know, give the sparks to people from our, from our advantaged standpoint to help, help other people. So how would you, how would I practically speaking do that? Well, you know, first, you know, the thing that haunted me about this book is I had a realization that every business book and every self-help book is elitist because it assumes you have the money to read the book, to buy the book. It assumes you have the time to read the book. It assumes you have the resources around you to take action. And I, it made me angry that I couldn't write a book that was, that was truly ap- applicable to everyone. And that's kind of where I go at, 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 at the, at the end of the book. Um, there is a great researcher, and I'm I'm forgetting his name. He's a very popular teacher at at uh, Harvard, and I apologize, I can't remember his name. But he do did a lot of work uh, about this idea of um, the sort of the tyranny of this idea of the American dream, and the truth is. Most people who who seemingly have the American dream, like the Winklevoss twins, you know, they were born. They had millions of dollars. They grew up in the Hamptons. They went to private schools. They went to Harvard. Blah 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 blah. Right. So there were, you know, they had this advantage that was kind of built in that most people uh, don't have. And so, the, the the this professor at Harvard, you know, writes about this that. If we were if we were all telling the truth about ourselves, that a lot of our success is based on somebody helping us, or having a lot of money in the bank, or whatever. And 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 the problem is is that a lot of people who don't have that advantage, they don't feel worthy because they think, oh, if I just worked harder, I could achieve the the the, the American dream. Hard work matters. It does. Hard work matters. Big ideas matter. Uh, you know, you know, it, it, and uh, you know, getting you know, working for an education that matters. I'm not dismissing that at all, but we also have to acknowledge that 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 not everybody has those advantages. Yeah, and, and I think at the same time, there's a lot of people being told. Yeah, that they just but, need but, to work but, harder. But, the, but I think right. the thing that is hopeful about the book is that it shows there's lots of examples in this book of people that started with nothing. Melody Hobson, the chairman of Starbucks, was was in destitute poverty. She grew up in destitute poverty, and uh, you know was living off a of government cheese. <laughs> and, and, and you and you look at you know the patterns in her life, and it's sort of follows this pattern of momentum. So this this is a book of hope. It really is. There's nothing in this book that that anybody couldn't do. You just have to be aware of how the world really works and then think about applying it to your own life. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm thinking about how I could help other people. So how can I find those people? Do I, how do I go help people and, and, reach down or whatever you call it. You know, one of the things I do, and I, I did this a lot in the pandemic, especially the early days of the pandemic, is I was kind of watching social media. Um, I'm not super, super active on social media, but I have a big social media presence. And you, if I saw somebody who was struggling or suffering, I'd write them a note and I'd say, Can, you know, do you need somebody to talk to? Do you need some help? Um, one of the things I do is um, I get requests all the time, you know, uh, from students, um, college students, even high school students who are they're working on a paper and they're trying to learn about business and they're trying to learn marketing. 
And they say, can I interview you for my paper? I never say no to student requests, never. And they're not going to be my customers, but it's just my way. It's just, you never know where that's going to lead somebody. You never know how that could change somebody's life. So if, if there's you know, anybody, if there's a student, if there's someone who just lost their job, if there's somebody who's going through, you know, a lot of personal pain, I say yes. It's, it's just my way of sending the elevator back down and saying, I'm going to do everything I can to create, you know, to get you moving in a better direction. Yeah, I, I love that. I, I think it's, to me, it's, I, I, I can do what I can do, right? So what, what do I have in my basket, in my skill yeah. set, in my right. whatever I have to share? Right. And, and if I find somebody that needs that, they can have that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 you told the story, and and now I'm mashing up a lot of the book and and podcast interviews and things like that in my head. But um, you 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 talk about the fact that mark to be a good marketer, you need to be part of the community, right? Marketing has to be for the community of yeah. the community. You tell the story of the the furniture store in. Um, in Houston, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that that to me is the perfect example of that. We have heat. Come yeah. get warm. Right. And I, I think that's – now we're sort of moving into like what does marketing mean today? And I want to give a shout-out to John Jones. Thank you for elevating Michael Sandel's name. He's the Harvard professor I couldn't remember. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you to do that. Um. You know, marketing today is like, like you said, it's not it's not being in the community; it's being of the community. Being in the community is giving a donation to the United Way. Being of the community is rolling up your sleeves and letting people see that you're helping at a in an emergency or a food bank, right? And the example that you're talking about was uh, my brother actually was in Houston when we had those terrible winter storms a few months ago. And uh, Texas just isn't prepared for that. And lots of people lost heat. They lost water. They lost power. And this furniture store said, if you're cold, come to our store. He had thousands of people come to the store. He brought in food. He set up a play area for the children. He had over 500 people a night sleep on the mattresses in his showroom. And you might think, well, what's that got to do with business or marketing? And I, I contend it's everything because great marketing is about creating an emotional connection between what you do and your audience or your customers. You know, what do they feel about you? Why would they recommend you to somebody else? It's because of a feeling. It's because of trust. It's confidence is beauty, whatever the feeling is. And I can guarantee you, nobody in the city of Houston is ever going to buy furniture from anybody again, other than this guy, because of that belief, because of that emotion. And, and, and especially in this pandemic, when so many people are suffering, so many of our customers are suffering, we have an opportunity to not only create an emotional connection, but to become legendary, to really be of the community and say, how do we fit in right now? How do we connect and how do we help lift our customers, you know, out of the out of the problems that we're having right now? And they'll they'll never forget you. Quick, I, I think do I, I have time for one quick other little story? Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Because this is one of the biggest lessons I learned. I was like 20, probably 27, 28. And early in my career, I was this, I was a sales executive. Uh, and we had a customer in Philadelphia and our quality was so terrible. We were shutting them down, that, but they kept buying from us. So I flew to Philadelphia. I had lunch with the president of the company. I said, I appreciate your loyalty, but I don't understand it. Why do you keep buying from us when we're destroying your company? Why aren't you buying from our competitors? 
He said, well, let me tell you why. He said, my, this company was started by my father. And during World War II, the greatest crisis our country has faced. What we were making at our plant was irrelevant. We were going out of business. We had to retool for the war effort. But we didn't have the equipment. We didn't have the money. We didn't have the technology. Your company came in, loaned us the money, got us the equipment, gave us the, techno the techn technical expertise so that we could get to the end of that crisis. And on my father's deathbed, he said, never leave Alcoa. They brought us to the dance. And they will never buy from another company other than my company because this is loyalty. This is emotion. This is becoming legendary that transcended generations. That's great marketing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's being, it's being a good human. I think that's, that's also the nexus of all of this, right? It's, we're talking about good marketing. We're talking about reaching up and reaching down at the same time. We're talking about removing friction and creating momentum. And, and I, it, you know, as you're, as you're saying all this, I'm, I'm picturing some small firm architect somewhere that could be involved in their community that could be opening doors for, uh, for clients and non-clients, for the kids of their clients that, that need help, whatever whatever the situation is. And then as it wraps back around, it all does make it legendary. It makes them it makes them a value to their community. Um, and it's it all seems to be intertwined together. So uh, I, I think that's I think that's a great way to to wrap all of that together. And somebody mentioned a Seinfeld reference earlier. So for the Seinfeld reference. It's that episode where Kramer is lost in New York City. He's in the phone booth. He's calling Jerry. And he says, Jerry, I don't know where I am. I'm at the corner of first and first. I'm at the nexus of the universe. <laughs> so, so there's your Seinfeld reference for, for whoever. I think that was Christian maybe that, that said that earlier. But uh, um, well, Thanks so much. And, and, and I also want to thank everybody who's been leaving all the amazing comments and, and, help, and just helping me with the things I couldn't forget. The, the the reference to, to mattress mac and so this has been great I, I love the energy of this group so congratulations jeff and Catherine, for nurturing such a such an amazing group and uh community here this has been fun and uh i hope you'll have me back again soon oh absolutely i i really appreciate you uh i appreciate that that comment uh and appreciate you for coming on I appreciate the book and and what I say to this audience every every afternoon Here's as we're wrapping this up, there you go. There's there's That's the book. It. Yep, get that it's wherever. Much. It's the Mandalorian. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but but I I do appreciate the comment because we we've been doing this since April 9th of 2020 every weekday afternoon. Good for and you. what I tell these folks every day is that um, they have made this happen. They have built this community. And if it weren't for them, um, we wouldn't be having this conversation with you now. So I appreciate all of them and all of their comments and all of their questions uh, for making it possible for us to have this conversation with you. And um, thank you for the book and, and, and all your other books, uh, you know, without going too fanboy here. Uh, I appreciate I appreciate all oh, of them. Oh do, oh do, oh do. <laughs> yeah. well, let me go down a list here. Um, uh, uh, you know, everybody needs that once in a while. Hey, thank you so much, Jeff. Sincerely, yeah. sincerely, thank you. And what made this special is that you really are familiar with my work, and that's that's what made this special because you could ask the right questions and the deep questions that that help everyone. So thanks, everyone. This has been so much fun. It's been really, really special. Great. Thank you, Mark. And, and to all of you out there, again, thank you. Uh, I'll be back again tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel, 4 p.m. Eastern inside the Entree Architect Community Facebook group. And tomorrow we're going to wrap up this whole conversation about momentum for this week. And we're going to talk about your goals. So what are your goals? Be thinking about that. Hopefully you've given it a lot of thought already. But we want to talk about what your goals, at least for the rest of the year, are. I'll be on Clubhouse tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern. Mark didn't even know <laughs> that we, we do Clubhouse. Every day. Every day. 
Um, and then, of course, 4 p.m. we'll be back inside the Entree Architect Community Facebook group. So, again, everybody be well, stay well, stay safe. Keep everybody around you safe and well. And uh, take a little bit of time to breathe this evening so that you can get a little bit rejuvenated and come back. Because we're going to do this again tomorrow. We're going to do it all over again. So, thanks, everybody. Appreciate you. I'll see you somewhere sometime soon. Bye, everybody. <laughs>